Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. There are more than 30 million people in the United States who have diabetes. That's almost 10% of the population, but they're not all adults. Yeah, there are close to 200,000 Americans under the age of 20 who've been diagnosed with diabetes. And here to talk about diabetes in the pediatric population is Mayo Clinic endocrinologist, Dr. Anna Creo, and nurse Janet Hansen. Welcome both of you to the program. Thanks for having us. Good to have you both, because unfortunately, there are a fair number of kids in this country who have diabetes. You are a pediatric endocrinologist, correct? Yes, so I treat kids with both diabetes, but also all sorts of different hormonal problems that can be born with or they can develop in life. So insulin is a hormone? Absolutely. And what does it do? Why is it so important? Yeah, so insulin is a key hormone. There's receptors all the way in the body, all the way from down our feet into their brain even. And without insulin, it really alters the body's metabolism. Insulin is kind of like the lock and key that really when we eat food or nutrients, allows those nutrients to go into our body for storage. And can you live without insulin? No. So you have to have insulin to help the the sugar get into the cells. Yes. Without it, there's no place for the sugar to go. So kids start urinating more. It's lost in the kidneys. Kids can't then gain weight and really lose fat mass quickly. So those are typical symptoms. Sorry, you said uh, they get thirsty and they urinate more often. Are those the two major symptoms? Yeah, parents notice all sorts of things. You know, in children as diabetes come on, sometimes it can be pretty silent for a while. But in general, unlike adults, Pediatric diabetes tends to be more progressive and progressive quicker. So there's oftentimes a period of feeling unwell, um, but then usually as the blood sugars are getting very elevated, people tend to know symptoms sooner. They start to be urinating more, drinking more. Kids can start to have just very nonspecific stomach aches as well. They might be losing weight. They might be eating a lot and still losing weight as well. Is that What is juvenile diabetes? I mean, what we need to... Because that's what it used to be called, or is it still called that? So it's really not called that anymore. It's it's now more called uh, type 1 diabetes. It also used to be called insulin-dependent diabetes. Uh, but because of the difference between type 1 and type 2, both could be on insulin. So it's now referred to as type 1, which uh, for us in, in endocrinology, we understand that that means it's an autoimmune disease. And so the root cause of it is different than type 2. Okay, explain autoimmune. So autoimmune being that the cells of the body are are looking at those beta cells, the the insulin producers in the pancreas, and it's identified almost as a germ or a bacteria. So in similar ways, when we are ill, we have a, a flu or a viral illness, our body attacks those cells in order to help us become well because they look like germs they are attacked, and over time, there aren't enough there to produce insulin. So the immune system is actually attacking cells that we really need. Correct. Yeah. So are we pretty convinced that diabetes type 1 is an autoimmune disease? Yes. Yeah, and we commonly now measure antibodies, because sometimes it's not always easy to tell it's type 1 or another type of diabetes. There's most common types as type 1, where there's the autoimmune attack in the pancreas, but more and more commonly is type two, even in children. And that is not autoimmune, that's associated with extra weight and the insulin not being able to work as well or insulin resistance. So we have heard that that type two is increasing, as you're saying, is type type one increasing as well? Both rates are increasing. So there's a good study that came out from our first pilot data from 2000 up to 2009, the first time I really look at it, the rate of type 1 has doubled, but the rate of type 2 is also increasing. So right now, about 1 in 500 kids have type 1. And depending upon where you are in the country, about half that rate for type 2. So depending upon where your practice is and the populations in your practice, you could see as many type 2s as type 1. And the secret out there, too, is that there's even rarer types of diabetes that babies can be born with that are more associated with genes that have gone awry than an actual problem with autoimmunity or insulin resistance. So we do take care of those kids on rare occasions, too. Is that then categorized as a third type of diabetes, or is that more treated like a 1 or a 2? Um, so there are what we call kind of monogenic 
diabetes, where it's not autoimmune, it's not insulin resistance, but it's just one gene Mm -hmm. that went wrong in the pancreas that's just not working as well. So I can understand why there's an increase in the number of kids with type 2 diabetes because of the obesity epidemic. But why, how do you explain an increase in the number of kids who have type 1? You know, in general, we're seeing a higher rate of autoimmunity of multiple different types of autoimmune diseases in kids in the past 20 years. So type 1 diabetes is just like other things that are on the rise, like celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease, and other autoimmune conditions in kids. Any other risk factors um, with regard to the development of type 1 diabetes? Yep. So having a sibling increases your risk a little bit. Having a parent with type 1 diabetes increases your risk a little more if it's from dad than from mom. Um, Other things that can increase your risk is it kind of travels in the same genetic tendency as other autoimmune conditions like celiac disease is a big one or autoimmune hypothyroidism. So it's kind of a same family of genetic tendency. So let's talk about the complications and and how important it is to control your uh, blood sugar, which is why insulin is so important because if you don't, there are some bad things that, that can happen. Tell us about that. Yeah, there's a whole kind of range when we think about complications from diabetes. The more classic ones are kind of the long-term things you worry about in adults. So, you know, eye disease, microvascular disease, kidney disease, kind of atherosclerosis, and even early dementia and Alzheimer's. But how important now we're thinking are the more immediate complications of diabetes on the brain and development and sports, as well as adapting diabetes. So to go into more detail, you know, we've done a lot of research here at Mayo Clinic looking at the role of even kind of states of hyperglycemia on brain and cognition. Hyperglycemia meaning yeah, too high much blood, blood, blood sugar, sugar. Too much high blood sugar, yep, sugar. on brain. And they're really even, you know, not even looking long-term, if a child has a higher blood sugar, they have a change in their cognitive performance. So even with school and learning, it's really important. And then the other kind of, you know, it's not a medical complication, but just adapting mm-hmm. diabetes to a child's life. We like to say we don't adapt your life to diabetes, we adapt diabetes to your life, but that in itself can be really challenging too. Right, and sometimes it's even parents adapting to that diagnosis. It can be really challenging to send your child off to school, whether they've had diabetes and now they're starting kindergarten, or you may have a teenager that now it's time to go back to school and they've just had diabetes for a handful of days. That can be pretty stressful, or sending them to an overnight at a friend's house, um, sending him off on the bus to an away basketball game and not being able to be there um, is really hard for parents as well. And All right. Could, oh, Sorry. Even imagine, too, with, say, you have a toddler, an 18-month-old, you know, kids down to 18 months can get type 1 diabetes. All the usual food refusal, food battles compounded with the fact that child has diabetes and needs to eat a structured meal and structured program. It's just lots of challenges. All right. We'll talk more about that when we come back. We need to take a short break. We're talking about kids with diabetes with Dr. Anna Creo and Nurse Janet Hansen. When we come back, we'll talk about how they make the diagnosis of diabetes in kids, and also we'll talk all about the treatment. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. We are with two experts on pediatric diabetes, pediatric endocrinologist Dr. Anna Creo and nurse Janet Hansen. We've talked about the causes of diabetes, including type 1 and type 2. We've learned that type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease. We've also talked about the risk factors. And now it's time to talk about the diagnosis. Would you say that most of the kids that you diagnosed are are brought in uh, because their parents notice something abnormal? You know, we notice a whole variety of patterns. There are common times of the year where diabetes tends to be brought up more back to school where the nurse notices, oh, they look a little bit different this semester. Or Halloween with all the candy because, you know, kind of can bring out lingering diabetes on the verge of declaring. But sometimes too, families just notice, you know, my child is just slowing down. Something's not right. They're losing weight. They're drinking all the time. We had recently a, you know, a young child that was just going to the bathroom over and over and over again and they had been fully trained through the night. So all kind of typical presentations. Whereas other types of diabetes associated with obesity can be a lot more subtle, though those are picked up more on lab testing. So kids, most kids don't necessarily get a blood glucose or a blood sugar as a routine part of a, a well child exam, right? No, no. 
So it's usually uh, the parents who bring them in because something's not right. Right. Um, with the rise of obesity, it is recommended with obese children later to start to have some recommended glucose screenings. So we do pick up type 2 diabetes by lab testing, but not so much for type one. And type two diabetes is where you have the insulin, but it because of your body weight, there's not enough? Because is the body, it? it's, there's sometimes not enough or just not working as well. And it kind of can snowball too in the fact that with more body weight and more insulin resistance, sometimes the pancreas has trouble keeping up. It would, it, what I don't understand about that part though is if you have a family history of type two diabetes, you don't have to be obese that doesn't have to be part of the of the equation, does it? Um, it certainly makes things worse, but there are just families that are more insulin resistant. We see them more commonly in less Caucasian populations where it doesn't take that much extra adiposity or fat to cause type 2 diabetes. All right, once the parents bring them in, how do you make the diagnosis? What do you do? Yeah, so it depends upon how sick the child is. Some kids that are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes are very ill to begin with. The problem with untreated type 1 diabetes is that without insulin, that's kind of the lock and key to get the blood sugar in their cells, acid builds up in the blood. And so what we call that is diabetic ketoacidosis. So about 20% of kids are actually diagnosed when they're critically ill in with this acidosis at the VR. So sometimes we're so really So they come families. into the ER, you mean? We come into really the ER, sick. yep, yeah, really sick, and that's not uncommon. No kidding. Uh, you said 20% of, of kids. And, and then, as obviously, um, you do a blood sugar and it's off the charts. Yep. All right. And um, there are two tests. Uh, tell us about blood glucose and also the test A1C. Great question. So blood glucose is just the measure of sugar in our blood. There's kind of what we call preprannual or before you eat when it's fasting. There are certain targets for that. And then there's postprannual as well, looking for how high the blood sugar goes after we eat. All of our blood sugars rise a little bit after we eat, but there's good clear cutoffs for how high is too high. As opposed to the hemoglobin A1C, the sugar attaches to a red blood cell, and red blood cells in our body last 90 days. So we go back and we look how much sugar is there, and we can extrapolate based upon the past 90 days what the blood sugars have been as long as you have otherwise normal red blood cells. So treating these kids is a fairly uh, complex uh, affair, and I guess that's why you are both here, because you have a team. You, you have a team approach, and who all is on the team? Obviously, Nurse Hansen. Who else? So we have our pediatric endocrinologists, like uh, Dr. Creo, one of those, myself, and uh, several other nurses. We have dietitians that work specifically with our kids that have, uh, have type 1 diabetes. We have a pediatric social worker that... Uh, meets with all of them and that one sometimes is a little harder to understand why we would have a social worker but uh, some of that is just to help navigate insurance issues that might come up for families um, helping financial issues because the the cost of diabetes and supplies can be pretty expensive it might be helping them navigate school what do public schools have to provide for kids, teenagers starting jobs. What, uh, what do employers have to let them do while they're at work in order to manage their diabetes and things like that? So we do have a social worker with us. Um, and then we, those are, are folks that see our kids almost every visit that they come in. But then we also have uh, gastroenterologists. If somebody has celiac disease that we will reach out to, we have child psychologists. If there are other other behavioral needs or you know anxiety uh depression the uh those mental health issues are increased with a chronic illness um it's not so just the kids it's a big team it's the family yeah. the parents have everything that you just listed off the parents are basically in charge of making sure that those things happen and so just the, this has the got to be yeah. too, coming from you know say you have a two-year-old diagnosed it's the parents and making that transition throughout pediatrics to by the time they're 18 it's the young adult that has control of their diabetes and everything that goes in between so tell us what's involved uh, you obviously ha have to track your blood sugars and you have to give insulin how do you go about starting that whole program yeah so great is kind of distinguishing between again the two types of diabetes right type 2 being where there's insulin resistance versus type 1 where there's just lack of insulin from autoimmune attacks type 2 diabetes sometimes depending upon how high the blood sugars have been can be treated with medications by mouth to help the pancreas just work better but if it's getting worse, 
some type 2 diabetics need to go on insulin as well, and all type 1 diabetics need insulin. We've tried for many years, but the only way to give insulin back is by shots. Um, there are different ways, though, to get that in. So the general fundamentals is that we give insulin back by shots or pumps, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, as well as... So there's as no pill. There's you, you no pill, pill for type 1 diabetes. So unlike right. you know, a child's grandparent that has a pill to help their diabetes, for type 1, there's no pill. So you have to give insulin by injection. Injection. Fortunately, we're getting the technology is getting better and better and better. So there's alternate ways now to give insulin back by insulin pumps as well. Now, tell us about an insulin pump. Yeah, so... Kind of the, the very basics for type 1 is doing injections and checking blood sugars by finger pokes. Mm -hmm. But as the technology, there's kind of two broad categories called glucose sensors and insulin pumps. And they're starting to become more and more integrated. So a while ago now, we've had insulin glucose sensors. There are different devices. There's different brand names. But they can stay on a child's body for up to 10 days and they're approved to make insulin dosing decisions off of. So they're always checking the blood sugars. And it's nice too, because depending upon the brand, oftentimes it can go to multiple devices. So parents can have their child's blood sugar on their phones. The school nurse can have it as well. And so you're always seeing, and you can even set alarms with a lot of the brands as well, like a high blood sugar alarm or a low blood sugar alarm. Is, is it like a patch? Yeah, on the back of the arm, it, that's what I've seen. I, I, the, the arm is the most typical site, but we've had lots of creative places where you can put them as well. They <laughs> tend to work pretty well. So if you have that that monitor, you could look at your smartphone, and yep. it'll tell you what your blood sugar yep. is. Mm -hmm. And then, But then you have to give yourself the, the insulin, or do, so, are the, it cannot be connected to the pump, so it goes automatic. Yep, so, 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 so we usually start patients on injections to get used to the insulin and getting used to kind of simple diabetes management. So we do have patients with just have the sensor and are doing injections about four times a day. But with the pump, previously pumps worked independently. They, the pump would kind of squirt out insulin a little bit. Even when we're not eating, our bodies always need a little bit of insulin and then would have boluses when we eat. But now the technology is really coming along where the first generation were that in the brands. If the child is getting too much insulin with a pump, it can cause a low blood sugar. And the first generation was that the pump would listen to the CGM or the continuous glucose, glucose meter. Monitor, yeah. And if it was predicting or the child was having a low blood sugar, the pump would shut off. So they would start to talk to each other. The second generation is that it was predicting if the glucose meter was sensing that the child was going to be low, it would shut the pump off before the child even had mm -hmm. a low blood sugar. Now the newest technology is what we call a closed loop where they're always in communication every five minutes. The insulin, the child is getting insulin based upon really complex deep learning algorithms and always giving insulin based upon how, what it's learned from the child's patterns. Pretty incredible. So what's the, what's the biggest challenge, would you say, in treating these kids? Oh, that's a tough one. Compliance? <laughs> I mean, I'm you know, if you're a 14-year-old teenager, boy or girl, you don't wanna mess with all this, but you're making it easier and easier, it sounds like. It is getting easier and easier. I think every challenge is different for every family. And there, but there's there are common themes. You know, just getting burnt out of diabetes, I think, is a really common one we see. Behavioral challenges with the littler children. Yeah, and I think sometimes with the pumps, we have to remember they still don't do it all. And so sometimes it's just merely they have to tell the pump how much they're eating when they eat it. And so, <clears throat> like you said, for compliance, for teenagers, they want to be like their friends. So it may sure. be that I don't want to pull my pump out in front of my friends. I just want to have lunch. And so they may not be giving that insulin when they're eating. And that makes that automated part of things a little more challenging with the pumps. Yeah. But Compliance really wanting is a problem. to be, be yeah. like their friends, I think, is is true in all age groups. And they, I'm sure they also realize that this is a lifelong issue. It's never going to get any better. Unless they have a pancreas transplant. So someday, we're hoping huh? the technology is getting better and better, and there's a lot out there right now for transplantation. The problem is to keep the transplant often requires more cumbersome methods than just having the technology. The technology is getting so good. All right. Well, we know there are close to 200,000 children with diabetes in the United States, and it sounds like both type 1 and type 2 are becoming more common, unfortunately. And we know that left uncontrolled and left untreated, diabetes can have some very untoward complications. Treatment can be difficult and challenging, but there are some new technologies that are, are truly helping. 
Fortunately, there are experts like you who are also able to help these families and these children. Our thanks to Mayo Clinic pediatric endocrinologist Dr. Anna Creo and Nurse Janet Hansen. Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you.